of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your
but you have an opportunity to get involved with that as well. Uh, there are many places that are working with Samaritan's Purse to provide Operation Christmas Child boxes so you can find a location uh, close to you where you can get boxes. Or if you have, are finding it hard to get out or uh, would prefer to fill a box online, Samaritan's Purse has that option and we have shared links to that on our church's face, Facebook page. And so check that out when you're on our Facebook page. That's it for our announcements. Our call to worship is Psalm 36, verse 5 to 9, where it says, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Let us pray. Almighty God, we welcome your presence as we worship you today. We rejoice in the hope and in the love you offer each of us freely. Bless this time in which we have gathered to sing your praises, to hear your word, and to offer you our heartfelt prayers. Let your pure light shine amongst us today. Renew our strength as we focus on you and prepare our hearts to receive all that you wish to give us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The glory of the risen Lord Who can compare With the beauty of the Lord Forever He will be The Lamb upon the throne Gladly bow the knee and worship him, my Lord. I will proclaim the glory of the risen Lord who once was slain. Reconcile man to God Forever you will be The Lamb upon the throne I gladly bow the knee And worship you carry them all the time. 
And I gotta tell you, this backpack is heavy. In fact, every day it seems to get heavier and it, it rubs on my shoulders and it's really getting to be a pain. You know, it's not only a pain, but it's really hard to, to just feel happy because not only do I have this, but every time where I go, I carry this backpack, which makes life so much harder. You know, it's harder to get in the car wearing this backpack. You know, it's hard to, to walk down the road carrying this backpack. It just tires me right out. You know, it's hard when I'm trying to do stuff at home, uh, like running around. Ugh, who wants to run around with a big, heavy backpack? Boy, it's just, it weighs me down, and it just kind of makes me miserable. You know, this this backpack is just an object lesson for us. I'm just, I don't normally wear this backpack. In fact, I'm going to take this backpack off because it is heavy and uncomfortable. I'm wearing this backpack today because I want to talk about forgiveness. So you see, when we hold on to things, like when we hold on to grudges, when we hold on to a record of all those things that are wrong that people have done to us, when we hold uh, uh, all those hurts and acts of frustration and we carry them with us, you know, that's a big heavy load to carry and it can make us miserable. Now here's something for you. You probably know that the Bible teaches us that we're to, come, we're to forgive each other, right? The Bible teaches a lot about forgiveness. But here's the thing. When you forgive someone, you're letting them off the hook. But did you know when you forgive someone, you're, you're letting yourself off the hook too? You're not only showing that person who's wronged you and love, but you're showing yourself love as well. Because you're letting them off the hook. But you're also saying to yourself, I'm not going to carry these hurts, these wrongs, or whatever it is, these records, any longer. So we can let go of all that weight that is weighing us down, that holds us, that makes us sad, that makes us uh, feel like life is bleh, you know, where it makes us kind of feel miserable and tires us out. When we forgive others, we lighten the load that we carry as well. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, just, uh, or just as in Christ God forgave you. So let's remember, when we forgive others, uh, we're not only showing them love, we're showing ourselves love too. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the reminder today that when we forgive others, we're not only showing them love, but we're being kind to ourselves as well. When we've been hurt by others, it's sometimes really hard for us to forgive. So God, we ask for your help to let go of those hurts when we have been, and when we're having a hard time letting go ourselves. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
You know, we've been working through a sermon series since uh, almost the beginning of summer in which we have been looking at some of the basic beliefs that we as Christians hold true. We've been using the Apostles' Creed as our roadmap for our journey and it's been a really good journey. We've covered a lot of ground. You know, we've talked and looked at uh, what uh, a lot of stuff about God, the Father Almighty, and it, and in Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior. And we've looked at the Holy Spirit. And we've also taken time uh, to look at the special relationship that God holds with the church. And the church is not a building, but the church is made up of all those who put their faith in Jesus. It's been great looking at each of these things. And so we're going to continue on today uh, with this sermon series as we look at Psalm 130. It's not too often we get to read an entire psalm, but we're going to do that today, which is great. And so again, we're going to be reading Psalm 130. Now, if you've been with us through this sermon series, you know what I'm about to share. I take some time uh, in each of these sermons to talk about the Apostles' Creed. I do that because uh, first we may have visitors or pe new people joining us that aren't familiar with the Apostles' Creed. But I do that also as a reminder for us because not, not everyone uh, grew up with the Apostles' Creed or familiar with it. And it's important for us to understand um, the significance of the Apostles' Creed. So first, I'd like to remind us that the Apostles' Creed, the purpose behind an Apostles' Creed, is like any other creed, is simply to state a set of beliefs. You know, the Apostles' Creed is a wonderful tool for us to use to help us understand our faith better. It's a great tool to use when people have questions about our faith. We can turn to the Apostles' Creed as sort of a summary of things that we believe which can get the ball rolling if you're having a conversation with someone who has questions about the faith. Now, what's important to know here is the Apostles' Creed is a tool. It does not replace uh, the Bible, nor does it replace our need as believers to be spending time in God's Word. Okay, so we remember that. Now, the other thing I want to talk about when it comes to the Apostles' Creed is why we're using the Apostles' Creed. There are other creeds out there. 
Now, we have chosen to use the Apostles' Creed for two reasons. One, it's old. The Apostles' Creed is about 1,300 years old. And during this time that it's been around, people have studied it, they've picked it over, they've examined it, and the wonderful thing about it is it has withstood the test of time. So that is fantastic. Now the second reason we're using the Apostles' Creed is because of how universally accepted uh, the Creed is. And that, that means that it is, it is accepted across so many churches and so many different denominations. And so, yes, Christians from different uh, locations, different churches, different denominations may have some differences of opinions, but one of the things that we can be encouraged by when we look at the Apostles' Creed is that when we look at the core beliefs that we hold true, it is wonderful to know that we hold so many things in common with our brothers and sisters in Christ in other churches. So that is fantastic. Now, during this sermon series, I've invited you to recite the Apostles' Creed with me, and we're going to do that in a moment. I do want to point out, as I do in each of these sermons, one line, and I do that because it is the line that I get asked the most questions about when we talk about the Apostles' Creed, and that line is, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Now, just to avoid confusion, let me explain that the word Catholic in the context of the Apostles' Creed means universal. So this is a reference to the universal church which all Christians, no matter what local body, no matter what local church they belong to, are all a part of. Okay? So, with that explanation, let us now recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father. Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for reciting the Apostles' Creed with me. Uh, today, as we move along in our journey, we've reached that line in the Apostles' Creed where it says that we believe in the forgiveness of sins. Today, it's all about the subject of forgiveness, and I'm looking forward to digging into that a little deeper with you. We're going to take a moment to pray before we go into our scripture, and after we pray, we'll read our scripture, and then we'll get digging into the subject. So join with me now as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to this time in which we turn to the Bible, we ask that you open your word to us uh, as we look at the subject of forgiveness. Help us to grow in our understanding of this important subject. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And with that, let us read Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, keep a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I will wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Well, friends, for us to understand what forgiveness is and why we need forgiveness, we must first look at what needs to be forgiven. 
The Genesis account of creation found in the Bible teaches us that God created everything in the universe, including us. And what was created was good. Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 says, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Now you can imagine uh, that everything, you know, take a moment here and just imagine uh, that everything at one point that God had created was good. That's a wonderful thought. Sadly, uh, that good didn't last. By Genesis chapter 3, things had turned for worse. Uh, at that point, humanity, which consisted of only two people, Adam and Eve, messed up. Adam and Eve, while they lived in, uh, lived in that perfect garden that was called the Garden of Eden, chose to disobey God. And in so doing, they broke the fellowship that uh, they once enjoyed with God, our Creator and Sustainer. This barrier that separated them from God is called sin. And from Genesis 3 on, the Bible describes how God has worked to break through that divide so that our relationship with Him can be restored. But what is sin? It was the United States Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart who first coined the phrase, I know it when I see it. And he used those words when he, did, when he was describing the threshold test for obscenity. If I asked you what sin is, you probably could give me a whole list of things that would be, fall into the category of sin. But... If I asked you to define it, if I asked you to define sin, you probably would have a harder time doing that. Sin is described in the Bible as a transgression of the law. And it is also described as a rebellion against God. Listen to a couple of these references in the Bible. From 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, sin is described as a transgression. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And from Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 7, sin is described as a rebellious act. Remember this, and never forget how you aroused the anger of the Lord your God in the wilderness. From the day you left Egypt until you arrived here, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Sin, as simple as it may first uh, sound, is actually more complex. All of creation is suffering the consequences of sin through Adam and Eve's disobedience. Through Adam and Eve's act of disobedience, uh, sin entered the world, and through them, each person born is bent towards sin. Now, I know that's a bold statement. You know, everyone is bent towards sin. How can I say that? What about children? You know, I have two kids of my own. They've, they're grown up. My son is 21. My daughter is 19. Um, but, uh, you know, they've demonstrated to me more than once that they're not perfect. Even when they were very small, they showed me that they weren't perfect. In fact, they showed me that they could do, do things that uh, were not very nice. Um, and it is one of those things that all parents, all people who have the privilege of raising children eventually see. Uh, it is just part of our lives that uh, we uh, are bent towards uh, committing sin. And we are bent towards doing things that are wrong. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. In theological terms, this leaning towards sin 
uh, that we are all affected by as descendants of Adam and Eve is called inherited sin. The Reverend John Wesley, who this church's denomination derives its name from, namely the Wesleyan Church, defines sin as a willful transgression of a known law of God. But there's more to sin than just a willful act. It has been said that sin is anything that turns our hearts from God, and because of that, sin can be broken down into two categories. The first being the willful or voluntary sins or acts that we choose to do, knowing that they are wrong, yet we still do them. And acts like these are acts like lying, stealing, committing adultery, or murder. I'm sure you can think of a whole bunch of other uh, things that we can choose to do that would be sinful. The other type of sin is maybe a little harder to trace. This sin is called involuntary sin. When one participates in these sinful acts, one might not intend to do evil, but the consequences of these acts leave their marks on our hearts. It might be easier to understand if I give you an example of what I mean. So let me share one. Uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 3, the apostle Peter speaks to a crowd of people after he has healed a man through the power of Christ. And so, uh, he is talking to this crowd of people who are wondering how this all happened. And, and he brings up Jesus and he talks about Jesus and he says to them, he says to them, uh, that now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted ignorant and in, in, in ignorance, as did your leaders, when he told them that he that they were responsible for Jesus' death. Those who made up the Sanhedrin, including the high priests and, and the prominent Sadducees and Pharisees, believed that Jesus had blasphemed. Uh, against God, and the consequences of blasphemy was death. And so they stirred up the crowds, and everyone was yelling, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! Crucify Him! Yet, as we know, Jesus did exactly what He said He was going to do, and Jesus was exactly who He claimed to be. Therefore, Jesus was an innocent man when he was crucified by these people who are now, who were required to keep the law. And in their willingness and in their encouragement to see Jesus crucified, they inadvertently committed a sin. Alright, so that's what sin is. Just to summarize for us, what sin is, before we move on, sin is anything that turns our hearts from God. Through Adam and Eve's act of disobedience, sin has entered the world, and because of that, we have all sinned. Sins can be broken down into two categories, the willful or voluntary acts that we commit, and also the involuntary acts. What is important to know when we talk about sin is that it is sin that separates us from us as humanity from God. Now today's scripture asks a very important question. If you, Lord, keep a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? As we have looked at sin a little bit more deeply today, the answer is obvious. No one can stand up to that record. The Bible says, for all, have, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But here's the good news. There is hope. There is hope that for us. Our scripture continues to go on to say, But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in His word I put my hope. You know, this uh, psalm was written long before Jesus walked on earth. At the time of writing of this psalm, uh, this person was 
like all God's chosen people, looking forward to the day when the Messiah, the Savior, the Christ, would arrive. The hope that this psalmist was looking forward to has arrived. It is Jesus, our long-awaited Savior. It is Jesus that we can receive forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 tells us, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. So what is forgiveness? Forgiveness from the, in a biblical perspective is a release or a dismissal of something. It is, in other words, letting go of something that is owed. When it comes to sin, forgiveness is a release of sinners from God's just penalty and the complete dismissal of all charges. The Bible tells us if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. A simple definition when it comes to the word righteousness is saying that we righteousness is being right with God. So the forgiveness of all unrighteousness is putting aside those things that don't make us right with God. Forgiveness is an, an integ integral part of salvation. We cannot receive forgiveness until we first acknowledge that we need, you know, that we have sinned and that we need forgiveness. The Bible says, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to Him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that His word has no place in our hearts. When Jesus forgives us of our sins, trespasses, iniquities, and transgressions, they're all erased. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, what Jesus was literally saying was, it was paid in full. Jesus had paid the price for our sins. He took on the full punishment we deserve, so that when God forgives us of our sins, we are set free. The debt has been paid in full. Amen? Amen. Friends, I want to close by saying that if you have more questions about forgiveness and you want to talk, then I'm here for you. I'd love to sit down uh, and continue the conversation. It is an important conversation to have. We all need forgiveness. Not, no one is perfect. I'm far from being perfect. Know that you're not alone. We're all in this together. Don't be afraid to ask for forgiveness from God. You know, don't be afraid and say, well, God, uh, you know, God won't be interested in hearing me ask for forgiveness. Listen to this. God didn't do all that he did because he didn't care about you. God loves you. He loves you and he wants that barrier that separates you from him to be broken down. And he's made that possible. He's made a way where it was impossible, and now the ball is in your court. He's waiting for you. So there you go. Open the door and let him in. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what an amazing thing to receive from you. How wonderful it is to know that through your love, your grace, your mercy, we may receive forgiveness and new life. Lord, we pray for any of those here today who are watching, who are with us today. We pray for them asking, Lord, if they are carrying the hurts and they're carrying pain and they know that they, they need forgiveness, Lord, we pray for them. Help them to come to you, to make that choice, to ask for forgiveness and to put their faith in Jesus. Lord, help them to let go of those things and instead take hold of you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Wow. Amen. Amen. One more song. Amazing grace, how sweet the 
sound the same the rich like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free